Hi. A few videos ago I said that I was working on an auxiliary power unit for our larger drones and uh, in the more recent videos I've hinted at it. So tonight what I'm going to do is I'm going to describe the design of the generator and go through some of the principles behind the design and then we're going to take this outside and I'm actually going to run it and show you how it works. The argument for doing this is that the energy density of lithium polymer batteries is about 1 20th that of gasoline. And if you could generate the power with a gasoline engine, drive generators and um, produce good voltage control for a drone, you would substantially increase the payload capacity and the flight duration of the drones. And so the first thing you're going to have to decide is what kind of an engine to use and in that uh, power range of about one to five horsepower uh, you could either elect to get some of these uh, garden engines like say a Honda Mini and try to light, lighten it in order to make it flight worthy or you could potentially start with say an RC engine and then build up in order to incorporate it in, into a generator I elected to go with the RC route and because of the attractiveness of four-stroke engines with their fuel efficiency I got a single cylinder 40 cc Sato engine and earlier this year when it was a lot warmer I took it outside and uh, put it through some tests. We have it mounted on its side as uh, we are going to have it in the uh, final module. The um, servo here uh, controls the throttle the fuel is obvious. The two power supplies that you see on the other end are to provide power to the servo, which is controlled by a simple uh, pulse width modulation control here, hobby control, just for hand, just for testing. And the other power supply here provides electrical input for the ignition system, because as I said, there's no magneto. Finally, there's an RPM gauge here that reads the RPM of the engine at one-tenth of the actual RPM. If you see 300, it's at 3,000 RPM. The whole setup here was really originally just uh, put together so that we could test the motor, we could adjust the carburetor for proper operation at the right speed, and just make sure that everything holds together. The propeller is only going to be here for a few more minutes because it's necessary to cool the engine while we're doing the testing, but from that point on, the propeller is not going to be part of the operation. So I've already adjusted the power supplies to the proper voltages. Uh, the engine is already wired and the electrical supply is on. I value my fingers, so I use an electrical starter to start this. And I have the requisite sword that I use to prepare the engine for starting just to get it into the right position so the starter is uh, able to do its thing without having to struggle against the compression stroke. So what I'm going to do is put this together. It may be a little bit loud, but you'll hear it work. I'm going to turn on the fans now to keep the engine cool and then I'm just going to set up the motor and uh, start it up once again. Because there's very little load, the engine is going to have a tendency to run a little bit faster. So I've set the throttle down a little bit and starting it might be a little bit more of a challenge as well simply because there's a little bit less rotational inertia. As it turns out, uh, with further testing, uh, the Sato engine, the four-stroke single-cylinder engine, is a lousy engine for an APU. And part of the problem is that a four-stroke engine generates its 
energy during only one quarter of its 720 degrees of rotation. The problem with that is that a one horsepower engine uh, generating uh, about 5600 RPM, which is about the range we're working with here, produces one foot-pound of torque. Because this engine is operating at only 25% duty cycle, the torque that it has to produce is at least four times as great during that peak. So at two or three horsepower, you're talking about 12 to 15 foot-pounds of torque. Now in an airplane, it's kind of interesting because every time that engine produces its power stroke, it's accelerating the propeller and accelerating the air, producing a lot of momentum in the air. And the engine itself is experiencing a reactive opposite torque when it tries to move the propeller. What this does is it causes a 40 to 50 hertz rotational vibration in the airplane and there's nothing you can do about that because that, most of that momentum has been lost to the air. That's a little bit less of a problem in a generator because all of the torque is contained within the structure. The reactive torque of the engine is opposed by the reactive torque of the mounting of the generator. But in order to prevent vibrations from getting out, you have to build a very robust structure because we're talking about a lot of torque. So much torque that under certain high load testing, I actually broke the flexible coupling that we were using to connect it to the engines. And in order to try to keep that torque within the engine compartment, one of the problems with that is that you have to build a very strong, i.e. heavy, structure. So I decided that based on that problem, uh, that I would go to a two-stroke engine and live with the lower fuel efficiency because it would produce energy during 50% of its single rotational cycle. And to further reduce the vibration, I decided to use a twin cylinder small pair of two-stroke engines so that effectively, if the cylinders were operating out of phase with each other, there would be almost a continual power stroke. And that would substantially reduce not only the, the torque peaks, but it would also reduce the variation in the RPM of the generator. Because remember, the generator is always extracting energy from the rotating system. And so if the engine is producing torque almost all the time, you're going to get much less voltage variation that you then have to deal with downstream. In Thinking about that, I had ordered a couple of different manufacturers' versions of a 20cc or a 40cc, 20cc per cylinder, two-cylinder, two-stroke engine, thinking that I was going to get a nice continual power stroke. Turns out that both engines produced simultaneous uh, power and compression strokes. They were operating in phase with each other. So I didn't gain anything in terms of the smoothness of rotation. Everybody who's worked with RC engines knows, though, that they have less vibration than the single-cylinder engines, but it's not because of that reason. And I'm going to show you over here why that is. You might want to bring the camera over on this side because you're going to have to look into the engine. This is the same engine that I have mounted in the generator, and I've placed it on a balance so that you can see how it rotates. And because these engines aren't necessarily balanced about their rotational axis, I mean, there's no reason to do that, I've placed a counterweight on the other side so that it would be, it would be balanced in this position. If you look inside of the cylinder, you'll see just sort of darkness. But if I start to rotate, you'll begin to see that the piston moves upward. And as it moves upward toward top dead center into the top of the cylinder, it eventually reaches the top and then will begin to reverse. But at the very top position there, it no longer balances. Now in high quality car engines, what they do is they put a counterweight on the crankshaft so that when the piston goes up, there's a counter acting mass moving in the other direction and it prevents vibration. But in these smaller, cheaper engines, they don't do that. So every time the piston moves up, there's a reactive push of the engine down into the airframe or down into the generator frame and that produces a lot of vibration and there's no way to prevent that because even if you think ah I know what I'll do I'll line up my propeller with my piston and then I'll just counterweight the propeller in order to to balance it and it's a substantial amount in this engine it's 12 grams at a three inch radius nevertheless even if I balance the propeller when it's lined up with the pistons what happens is 
when the piston is halfway down and the propeller is at 90 degrees, effectively now you have an imbalance moving laterally. So all you do is you just transfer a vertical vibration to a horizontal vibration. So therefore I returned the two cylinder two stroke engines and what I did is I installed on the uh, generator two of the same engines right next to each other but if you look carefully here you'll see that I've coupled the two engines with a pulley and a timing belt and then lock the two engines 180 degrees out of phase so that their alternate uh, pulse, uh, power pulse and compression stroke means that I have almost continuous torque coming out of the pair. In addition, because they're 180 degrees out of phase, I can, in fact, balance the piston with the flywheel because when my flywheel on this side is outboard, my flywheel or my counterweight, my, my balance point is outboard on this side. So I'm able to balance with the 12 grams that I've placed on this, uh, this flywheel here, 12 grams that I've placed with this flywheel here, and so that all I'm doing is essentially producing a compression and a tension on the very robust mounting right in line with the shaft. So this is very low vibration uh, for both reasons and also shares the torque between the two engines helping to blend the, uh, the rotational um, speed. The other thing you'll notice here is that these stock mufflers, uh, they're, they're okay and they're very light, but they don't do too much to reduce uh, sound. It's still pretty loud. So what I did is I went ahead and I built uh, sort of a baffled glass pack type of muffler. And basically what these do is they're, they're mounted on the two engines like this but they are not one single unit because obviously there's not perfect alignment of the engines and there may be some heat expansion because the mufflers get pretty hot. So they're located close together like this with a high temperature coupling between them and effectively what they do is they allow the uh, pulse power of each engine to share the full volume of the muffler and what the fiberglass material or the silica fiber does is it helps to reduce the sound, the noise, because it absorbs some of that noise, but it also helps to absorb some of the dirty exhaust, the oily exhaust that come from two-stroke engines. So therefore what ends up coming out of the exit side of these two mufflers is hopefully a little cleaner and a lot quieter. If it's clean enough, I'll keep it behind the sound absorbing baffles on the output side of the, the entire engine system and that should effectively reduce the noise even further. So the next thing you're going to have to do is you're going to have to s decide how to generate the power. And if you go on YouTube, you'll see that a number of people who've built little DC generators, almost without exception, use automotive alternators as the power generator. And they're robust, they're inexpensive, they're easily available, and they're voltage regulated. So despite varying RPMs and varying current loads, they produce a stable voltage. The downside is they're inefficient and they are heavy. And both the weight and the inefficiency come from the fact that these engines, instead of having a free magnetic field from permanent magnets, the way they produce their magnetic field is that the voltage regulator will bleed off some of the generated power and feed it into a second set of coils, heavy copper coils that will produce a varying magnetic field to compensate for speed and current load. And that power that it bleeds off is not insignificant. That's what reduces the efficiency of the motors. So what I elected to do is to use a three-phase brushless motor. And the advantage with these is they're very efficient. They're very efficient. They're pretty inexpensive and they're very lightweight. The problem is they produce three-phase AC power, which we're going to have to deal with, and they're unregulated. There are four parameters that you're going to have to look at when you're selecting your motor. The first one's easy. It has to be able to handle the voltage that you expect to, to produce with your generator. The second one is not too hard either. In general, they're over spec especially the ones from China. And so I would say as a good rule of thumb, it would be a good idea to uh, pick a motor that has twice the current rating as you expect to use. That's probably a safe rule of thumb. The third feature is the KV of the motor. For some of you that don't know, 
kV essentially describes the amount of RPM the motor will produce per volt applied to the motor. So a 1000 kV motor unloaded will produce about 1000 RPM with one volt applied to it. Conversely, a generator that's given one volt will rotate without load at about 1000 RPM. The problem that you'll find is a 1000 kV motor could be as big as this room or it could be as small as one of these things. And so when you load them up with a substantial amount of current, the amount that the voltage will drop from what you predicted could be significant and it could be several times. So in order to determine what the kV rating you're going to need is, you really have to test them. And if you saw in a few videos ago, I had a tabletop DC motor that actually was able to allow me to characterize the different motors under real load and real RPM conditions. And so I was able to select the motor that I used. For what it's worth, I found in general that these motors will produce about half the voltage that you need at about half of their rated current. So for example, if I calculate unloaded that I want 32 volts, I need a KV motor that operating at the rotational speed that I expect should produce about twice that voltage. Very rough rule of thumb, I wouldn't design on it, but it may be a place where you might want to start. The fourth parameter on these motors I'll get to in a little bit is the pole count. But the first thing that you have to understand is we've got AC power coming out of these motors. And AC power has to be rectified. And in order to do that, you need diodes. These diodes here are examples of the diodes on the drone. And effectively what they are is one-way gates for electricity. If you have, say, single phase AC coming out of your wall, what you'll find is that the power that goes to the lead is varying at 50 or 60 times a second. And when the power is, say, positive, one of the diodes will direct the power to the positive side of the bus. When that lead is negative, the other diode will direct it to the negative side of the bus. But the diodes will not allow the power to drain across, will not allow the negative to short out the positive side. So when you're rectifying a two lead, single phase AC, with a full wave rectifier, you need two times two, or two diodes for each lead. In a three phase motor, you need six diodes, one, two, three, four, five, six but it's that simple. Now, the output that comes uh, to you is now rectified, but highly pulsatile. And you need to smooth that out for the ESCs. To do that, you use capacitors. The capacitors I have here are just for testing. They're not actually appropriate for the drone. They're not big enough. They actually can't store enough energy or operate at the current levels we're talking about. But effectively, what the capacitor does is it stores energy during the voltage peaks and then allows the energy to leak out to fill the troughs between the peaks, producing instead of a peaky output, an output that's relatively smooth with a small ripple. The degree of residual ripple that you get out of the capacitors depends on how big the capacitors are and how much energy you get with each of the pulses coming out of the motor. The final parameter that I was saying I was going to talk about is the pole count on the motor. The pole count is the number of um, polarity variations that the motor has. And in these 14 pole uh, motors, the AC current or the, the three phase current will shift 14 times per rotation. At the 6000 RPM that I'm going to be operating this system at, or 100 RPS, I will get 1400 three phase variations out of the motor. And when rectified, I'll actually get three times 14 or 4,200 pulses per second out of each motor. Just like I locked the engines 180 degrees out of phase, I've locked these motors out of phase with each other so that they each produce 4,200 pulses, but they're interleaved. So the input into the capacitor is occurring at about 8,400 hertz. The higher the pulse count, the smaller the pulse energy per pulse, the smaller the capacitors can be for a given amount of ripple. 100,000 microfarads here for a 2.2 kilowatt system at about 32 volts. And I have a, a, um, a, voltage, a residual voltage ripple of approximately 80 millivolts, which is pretty good. It's about 0.2 to 0.3% of the running voltage. It may even be too good. Nevertheless, 
The last thing that uh, you've got to look at here is voltage control. With this, we have to control the voltage by controlling the speed. And the way that we do that is we take the output from the capacitors, we use a voltage divider, and we send it into the analog input of an Arduino. And the Arduino then generates a pulse width modulated signal that then feeds the digital servo, which then controls the coupled throttles on the two engines. It's a good long-term strategic control for voltage but it's mechanical and anything mechanical is going to be slow. It takes hundreds of milliseconds for this to compensate for changes in the load. So the final step that uh, makes this work well is the fact that this is actually a hybrid system. We, we run the output from the generator in parallel with the output from effectively an 8S battery bank, much smaller than the batteries that you would normally put on the drone. But what they do is the batteries act as a sort of secondary buffer. The batteries certainly are a safety feature. Uh, if one of these many mechanical systems break or you run out of fuel, the batteries can at least get you to the ground. But the batteries have an internal resistance. It's quite low. The generator has a virtual internal resistance, which is higher than the batteries. And what that means is if I suddenly increase the requirements from the drone and the current needs to flow out very quickly, the voltage on the generator will drop more than it will from the batteries before the engine has had a chance to compensate for that. The batteries will buffer that change. It will work in reverse too. If I decrease the load suddenly, rather than the generator producing a higher voltage than the bus would desire, the extra current that comes out of the generator will go back into the batteries. They'll actually charge. Furthermore, the engines don't generate an absolutely continuous torque. There still are peaks and troughs even in the compression and the power strokes. And so there's a small varying ripple of about um, half a volt or a third of a volt at about 100 hertz that's coming out of the engine. The beauty is that that battery system actually helps to buffer that as well. It's actually being charged and discharged at about 100 hertz and produces a much more stable output. I was scared at first that that might damage the batteries, but doing a little bit of research, a number of papers have demonstrated that actually charging these batteries in a pulsatile way, rather than clamping it to a certain voltage and waiting for the battery to get there, may actually be beneficial to the batteries. The argument being that the uh, electrochemical byproducts of charging uh, have a chance between the pulses of charging to uh, dissipate or to move over the plates and prevent damage to the plates. I tested this uh, for a few hours at about 200 hertz. I didn't find any benefit to the battery, but absolutely no degradation of the battery. So it appears to work pretty well. So that's pretty much it for the system in here. And what we're going to do now, uh, I'm going to make an excuse. It's about uh, minus four degrees here right now. And so what I'm going to do is set this up outside, but I don't want to go through this long discussion of the uh, system in a parka. Okay, now we're outside or semi-outside. I've got the door open so the exhaust gases go this way. I've mounted a couple of temporary cooling fans over the unit that blocks your view, but basically provides the cooling because we don't have the enclosure to direct the cooling flow over the different components. You'll also notice here I have extended one of the generators with a starting cone so that I can use one of the typical Sullivan starting uh, devices that allows me to start this thing manually. You could start it electrically, but it is simpler and it is a little bit lighter, so I like to do that. In addition, you'll also notice the 8S fan, or 8S battery system that I have here, and you'll notice a power gauge. When I plug in the battery, you'll see that the bottom gauge will represent the current flowing into the resistors from the batteries. I'll do that now. Now if you look, you'll see that we've got about 12 amps at 30 volts going into those resistors and the top gauge is showing nothing because the generator is off. So I'm going to turn on the cooling fans. This will get a little bit loud. And then I'm going to try to adjust the uh, choke for this very cold weather. We'll see if we can get this to go the first time. One, two, three. 
exhaust coming out here. Hopefully you can hear what I'm saying. But if you come around to this side, you'll see now we're generating some current from the generator and we've actually lowered the amount of current that's coming from the batteries. As I increase the throttle, you'll see that the upper will begin to carry more of the load. Also notice that the voltage is remarkably stable. Now, no current at all, and all the current is coming from the engine. Okay, so the only other issue that I would present is that the generators that I'm using right now actually don't have an optimal KV. I used a slightly larger version of the same engine I showed you earlier in the video, but it was rated at 130 KV, and the ones that I'm actually going to use are 90 KV. That should allow me to get a little bit better current at the recommended voltage without having to overspin the motors up to seven or 8,000 RPM. But this is obviously very successful. So the next video we'll show you, we'll give you a little bit of an update about the enclosure. We'll improve the uh, generator uh, KV numbers a little bit. And uh, we'll also look at some of the uh, issues that we may face in terms of fuel flow. We'll do some uh, analysis of exactly how much gasoline we're using per minute of uh, current. So hopefully that was useful. This is a lot of fun. It's freezing cold out here, but uh, all in the name of science. Thanks for watching.